Hey there, Mr. Finley here, and we're going to talk today in this final uh, presentation on our theater history unit about different styles of theater in the 20th century, what we might call other isms. Now, as we discussed last week, by the late 1800s, writers begin to feel that the dominant forms of theater aren't addressing society's problems. This is when melodrama and comedy of manners are still the dominant forms of theater. And writers are saying, but they don't have anything to do with the problems of today, like poverty and life in factories, marriages falling apart. So we talked about one of the responses to this, and that was Henrik Ibsen developing realism in the hopes of making theater that was relevant, that actually dealt with the problems of society. And it was very successful in that, in combining realistic performance with classical structure. He developed realism, which remains the dominant form until the present day. But it turns out at the same time, other writers were thinking, well, maybe there's other ways to deal with this. And one writer in specific suggests a radically different sort of theater, um, unlike pretty much anything we'd seen up to that point, and sort of breaks off from this stream of realism. And this leads to an entirely separate set of other isms, of other ways of looking at the world that we put on stage. And that continues to this present day as well. So we see here in the late 1800s a split between the main branch of realism and then these various side branches of other isms. And that begins with this guy, August Strindberg. Um, August Strindberg, 1849 to 1912, he was writing about the same time as Ibsen, uh, but he totally rejected realism as being unable to deal with real problems. And incidentally, he hated Ibsen. Um, you can see he looks a little bit crazy there, and he sort of was. Um, they hated each other. They attacked each other in the street. I think it, Strindberg hit Ibsen with his walking stick. Uh, Ibsen had a full-length portrait of Strindberg above his desk. Because he said, I cannot write a word without the eyes of that madman upon me. And their differences extended to their, uh, their way of creating art as well, because Strindberg felt that no matter how realistic the sets or the acting, whatever you put on stage was going to feel fake. It wasn't going to be reality. So you should go totally in the other direction. You shouldn't try to make things real. Instead, he believed that only the logic of dreams and symbols could express truth. Um, this was the time when the early psychoanalysts were exploring the subconscious, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, um, and he said that's the way to do it to try and put on stage something that reflects our subconscious. And so he developed what he called symbolism, which is a type of theater that doesn't have a standard plot or characterization, but instead is full of dreamlike images and suggestions. Um, he actually started out writing naturalist plays, those super hyper-realistic ones. Um, there was one called Miss Julie that he wrote that was very famous, um, but then said, this isn't working. Let me try and explore the subconscious instead. And he wrote plays called, like A Dream Play, the title sort of gives you an idea of what that's like, and The Ghost Sonata, which is actually a fairly frightening play. It's full of very threatening, ominous image, images, but there's no real plot to them. They follow the logic of dreams and are full of very powerful symbols instead. So symbolism didn't last long as such. It eventually evolved into surrealism, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But most importantly, it opened the door for these vastly different unusual ways of creating a world on stage, um, of not just putting something we recognize on stage or something that we might believe is real, but putting just about anything on stage. And so following Strindberg, other writers were able to experiment with what other things we put on stage that may not resemble reality, but might give us another way to explore the truths of this world. So let's look at some of these other isms. The first of them that grew out of symbolism is surrealism. Surrealism is dreamlike and follows the Freudian logic of symbols and images instead of a plot. You know, when you dream, it doesn't have a rising action and a climax and a falling action. Instead, you know, you're going downstairs in your house and you open the door to the garage, but instead there's a giant waterfall there. And then you turn around and you see that, oh, actually I'm five years old and I'm being chased by a giant lobster. Um, there's no cause and effect in dreams, but there is this sort of internal logic where one image reminds you of another image and that leads you forward. Um, so that's uh, surrealism. The works of the painter Salvador Dali, and you see his famous image uh, there, are some ex classic examples of how surrealism looks. You've got weird combinations of images. Uh, it's not necessarily threatening, um, but it's sort of... Uh, 
curvy, melted maybe, um, but not realistic at all. There are very few fully surreal plays, simply because they don't make much sense, and most audiences aren't going to pay to sit for two hours and watch something that doesn't make sense. Um, so you'll have sometimes short surreal plays. Anton uh, Artaud, the French writer, um, wrote surreal plays, but they're usually like five to 15 minutes long and just these series of strange images. They're very shocking and interesting, but there's no real plot. Um, but the other thing is many surreal touches exist in other works and movies. Um, so you might have a basically realistic movie or play that has some surrealistic or dreamlike moments. Hitchcock would use this a lot. Um, in North by Northwest, there are many moments that feel like they could be in a dream, like a man in the middle of a, an empty field suddenly being attacked by a plane that comes out of nowhere, or um, crawling across a giant stone face. In the movie, that's actually Mount Rushmore. Um, and there's a realistic reason for all of these things given, but they're the sort of images that might come out of a dream. So there are touches of surrealism. Connected to this is this idea of expressionism. Expressionism developed around the time of the First World War in Germany and suggests that everyone experiences the world differently and that the world on stage should therefore be the world as seen through the eyes of the main character. Uh, they say that there is no objective reality. That reality only exists through our individual eyes, our experiences of it. So that's what we should put on stage. We should put on stage the world as seen through the eyes of the characters. Um, and now because the characters in these early works of expressionism were often tormented, this is hardly surprising, you know, it's Germany coming out of the First World War, the worlds that they exist in are often dark and threatening, lots of uh, sharp pointy angles and, and ominous images, because they said, well, that's how we experience the world, that's how we feel inside, so let's put that world visually on stage as well. Um, one of the famous examples of this was a, a film called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which was one of the very first horror movies, actually. Um, and there's an image there uh, from it. And you can see how sort of sharp everything is, the long shadows, the weird makeup that makes everyone look washed out. And it looks very weird. But the expressionists say, well, if you were paranoid and you felt you were being attacked, that's how the whole world would look like to you. Um, so that's expressionism. That is the world through the eyes of a given character. And while we often think of early expressionism as being threatening, any time you have the world in a play or movie as seen through the eyes of the character, that counts as expressionism. A great example of this is the film version of Chicago that came out a few years ago. Um, in this movie, there's a character, Roxy, the main character, who is obsessed with nightclubs and nightclub performances. And so as the movie progresses, all the important moments that happen, she sees as if they were acts in a nightclub. So she meets someone, and then suddenly there's a musical number on a stage with big curtains um, with that person singing, because that's how she views the world. That's expressionism. Um, seeing the world on stage as if it's through the lens of a given character. One of the weirder isms to come up is what we call absurdism. Absurdism arose around the time of the Second World War and was born out of the ridiculous amount of tragedy at that time. Things were happening that just didn't make sense. The incredible violence, the Holocaust. And writers were trying to grapple with, how can this happen? It doesn't make sense. It's ridiculous. It's, it's absurd that people should behave in this way. Um, and so absurdism was a style of theater that tried to reflect that. Its most famous proponent was a guy named Samuel Beckett, who wrote a lot of plays, his two most famous ones being uh, Waiting for Godot, and there's a picture of that there, and a play called Endgame. Now, Absurdism suggests that human action is meaningless, that we have no control over life, and the only thing we can do is laugh at the absurdity of our situation. That's why it's called absurdism. They say that the human condition is absurd. Now, this is a really bleak outlook. It's sort of incredibly depressing. But at the same time, there's at least some humor in it because they're suggesting, well, there's nothing we can do except laugh. So the plays are often... Um, rather bleak, but also have humor in them. The problem, of course, is if, if you're trying to suggest that human action is meaningless and we have no control over life, then that sort of goes against the ideas of a protagonist with a goal, uh, overcoming obstacles and rising action, and either getting that goal or not at the climax of the play. All those things that classical drama or realism require, and we talked about playwriting, those go against 
the ideas of absurdism. Um, and since the principles go against the very foundations of realism, absurdist plays often seem pointless and strange. But their point was that life itself was pointless and strange. And so they're trying to create on, on stage a world that behaves the way they see the actual world behaving, where no matter what you do, no good is going to come out of it. You can't control anything. It's very bleak, but it's tempered oftentimes by humor. The final ism that we're going to look at from the 20th century, and there are many other styles of theater as well, and you'll do look at them in um, the mini project that we do this week. But the last big one we're going to look at is something called theatricalism. Theatricalism also was developed around the time of the Second World War and was promoted by a guy, a German writer named Bertolt Brecht. He wrote several plays, the most famous of which was called the Caucasian Shock Circle. Caucasian in this case not having to do with uh, race, but actually having to do with the Caucasus Mountains in Russia, where the play is set, and there's a picture of it there. Now, theatricalism reminds the audience that they are watching a play. They don't try to make the audience forget the world on stage is artificial, like you would in a realism play, uh, but emphasize the fact that it is artificial. Uh, in realism, for example, the goal is often to make the audience forget that these are just actors and they're just watching a play, and to believe, at least on some level, these characters are real and get swept up in it. Theatricalism goes in the total opposite direction. It is always trying to remind you that, hey, this is just a play. These are just actors. They are not real characters. Any moment that you start getting swept up in the emotions, it tries to remind you, just actors. Um, and they often do this by having very bare sets. You sort of see that there in the picture. Um, instead of big, realistic scenery, the, the stage is bare. Oftentimes, it will even the back wall of the theater, that sort of bare brick wall will be visible at the back to remind you this is just a theater. The acting style is less realistic. It's often what we call presentational. That is the actor is trying to present the character rather than really be the character. And there may be even be moments where actors address the audience directly. They turn and say, hi, this is my name. This is the character I'm playing. In this scene, this is going to be what's going to happen. It's not realistic at all. It goes in the opposite direction. It's trying to remind you, hey, this is just a play. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, Brecht was very political, and he didn't want his audiences to get carried away by emotions, because he felt if they got carried away by emotions, they wouldn't be paying attention to the political message of a play. So instead, he wanted them to use their heads rather than their hearts, um, and was constantly trying to remind them, hey, this is just a play, pay attention to the meaning. Um, it turns out, though, that our hearts are pretty darn strong. So even when the actors and the style is constantly reminding us that, hey, this is just a play, um, our hearts get involved too. And so in the theatrical play, um, you get sort of both. You get your head involved because you're constantly being reminded that this is just a play, pay attention to what it means, but your heart gets involved too because uh, we are so interested in characters and their lives. Um, and so in aiming for the head, you get sort of the head and the heart both together. So those are some of the major different styles of theater. And we'll explore them more deeply this week in our mini project. Um, and bits and pieces of all of these styles and others get recombined in different ways to make the many different forms of theater that we see today. Uh, realism remains the dominant form, but it's not the only one. Um, there's all these different styles, and they can be traced back to Strindberg at the same time as Ibsen, striking off in his own direction and opening the door for all of these other styles.